Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a compelling, important, relevant, and obviously very timely webinar. The official name of this webinar, you've seen the graphics, is uh, over a thousand people have signed up, have registered to be a part of this COVID-19 vaccine, the transplant uh, community webcast. This is the second in a series of COVID-19 Transplant Community Coalition webcasts. Um, my name is Steve Adubato. Some of you around the country are asking, so who's this guy from New Jersey and what's his connection to the, this event, this webinar of the coalition? Well, I'm a broadcaster connected to public broadcasting, PBS in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region, uh, a longtime partner and colleague with the, um, by the way, I'm not sure technically what's happening, but Siri's talking to me in the middle of I'm, I'm talking to you right now. But um, by way of background, I have been working with the New Jersey Sharing Network for many, many years now. We're actively involved in a public awareness initiative around organ and tissue donation through Joe Roth and Elise Glennon and Bill Ryan on the national level. Uh, they got us into this. We're committed to educating and informing folks about organ and tissue donation. And that is why this particular webinar is so important. Um, also, I gotta tell you, think about this. I, I judge by, I guess it's March 4th or so, one year since we've been living with COVID-19. And I will tell you by way of background, my wife, Jennifer, who is um, in our home here in New Jersey somewhere uh, working, donated her kidney many years ago uh, to her brother who was uh, struggling in need of a kidney. And one of the first questions when COVID hit was, my wife, Jennifer, asking me, what impact could this, might this have on me? Meaning my wife, Jennifer. And we weren't sure where to get the answers. And so there are lots of questions. Obviously, so many people asking questions today. And that's just one of them for people who have donated an organ, for people who have our organ um, recipients. So um, this past year has taught us about res resiliency, what we don't know, the need to innovate, um, also the importance of science, trusting science. So today's discussion intended to inform and enlighten you, engage you. We're gonna hear from three important panelists who come to this very important issue of the, um, the COVID vaccine and its impact on the transplant community from very different perspectives. And um, what I'd like to do is, is acknowledge before we welcome our panelists, I'm going to acknowledge members of the coalition and also acknowledge that there's a grant from Novartis. If you haven't, you're not aware of that the coalition developed through that grant from Novartis, a central resource to help transplant the transplant community navigate these incredibly unprecedented times. You could see the website information up there, COVID19transplantresource.org. That'll be up several times throughout this webinar. You also see all of the sponsors, the partners in the coalition listed right there. In addition to the sharing network, you've got the Transplant Life Foundation, the American Transplant Foundation, the Chris Klug Foundation, the John Brockington Foundation, the Swing Foundation, of course, as I said, our friends at the New Jersey Sharing Network. Um, some statistics to consider. It's fascinating to me to pick this up. Uh, the coalition did some research and through a survey, they found that 94% of transplant community respondents were either planning to or considering getting the vaccine. Obviously that number really needs to be closer to 100%, but 94% is a significant number to consider. Um, lots of questions from over 1000 people who registered for this very important webinar today. We'll be getting to those questions in, in just a moment. Um, but we have three presentations, three very important presentations. And I want you uh, to welcome our first panelist. <clears throat> she is Leilani Graham. And hopefully we can see Le Leilani. There she is, some background on Leilani. A writer, a healthcare consultant based in San Francisco. She, she, so she is up very early this morning, 7 a.m. and just a little bit. She's a heart, plant, heart transplant recipient, a four-time cardiac arrest survivor, and spent over a week awake on an ECMO, which is a life-sustaining machine for heart and lung patients to assist them with gas exchanges that the lung would normally provide. Um, a very influential advocate. Leilani 
He's used her 20 years of experience and expertise for organizations. So Leilani, if I get this wrong, you'll tell me. Ted Med. For sure. The American Heart Association, Stanford Medicine, and well, and of course, Medtronic. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. And how was the weather out there on the West Coast? You know, we're supposed to be getting what they're calling an atmospheric river. Um, it doesn't really rain over here normally, but it's, it's quiet at the moment. So. <laughs> well, New Jersey, we've never had an atmosphere. What'd you call it again? An atmospheric river. They're making a I very big deal out of it. Now. That's, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. Uh, now, please welcome our second panelist. We're excited to have him joining us, renowned cardiac surgeon and recognized authority on advanced heart failure therapies, Dr. Brian Lima. You see Dr. Lima's smiling face and a little bit of his background. Let me tell you about Dr. Lima. He's getting to us, uh, joining us out on Long Island. He is with Northwell Health's surgical director. He is their surgical director, the first and only heart transplant program on the island, otherwise known as Long Island in New York. Dr. Lima also authored the best-selling book, Heart to Beat, a cardiac surgeon's inspiring story of success and overcoming adversity, the heart way. Did I get that right, Dr. Lima? Yes, right on target. Excellent. In March, Dr. Lima will be come. He's shifting gears in his very impressive career. He's going to become the surgical director of heart transplantation and mechanical circulatory support at Medical City, Dallas, Texas. Do I have that right, Dr. Lima? Yes. Yes, you do. Thank you so much for joining us. And our final panelist who will be presenting and engaging us this morning on the coalition's webcast, um, please welcome Dr. Janelle Ruth. You'll see Dr. Ruth's picture and some of her background is co-deputy of the implementation unit of the CDC's COVID-19 vaccine task force, an incredibly important task force connected to clearly the most respected healthcare public agency um, prior to serving in this particular role, Dr. Ruth practiced pediatric HIV and general tropical medicine in Malawi and the Baylor, with the Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative and subsequently completed her uh, Epidemic Intelligence Service Fellowship with the CDC. Dr. Ruth's CDC experience has spanned food and waterborne outbreaks, cholera prevention in Haiti. Talk about important work. Her current work is in the Division of Viral Diseases as the team lead for acute flaccid myelitis and domestic polio. We thank Dr. Ruth for joining us. Dr. Lima, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and have this opportunity to share this important information uh, with uh, everyone listening and watching. So um, I'm going to be just giving a physician or healthcare um, uh, perspective on uh, our experience, what we've seen with COVID uh, in our patient populations and why uh, I strongly believe that COVID vaccination is an important uh, priority for uh, potential or, or past transplant recipients. So basically, uh, when it comes to vaccinating uh, folks with COVID or to prevent COVID, like everything else in medicine that we do, a lot of it boils down to weighing the risks and benefits. Um, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And it's often a difficult decision to arrive at. And uh, you'll hear a lot from our other panelists about a lot of the data that we've uh, obtained about the benefits of uh, COVID vaccination, the efficacy of the vaccines. And I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about the risks uh, of not getting uh, the COVID vaccine or the risk that COVID itself poses to transplant patients. So these are two important types of risk that I think uh, weigh into our equation for figuring out whether or not uh, vaccination makes sense. So if we could go to the next slide, uh, being here in New York at Northwell Health, we uh, were in the eye of the storm, so to speak, when the pandemic really uh, uh, began uh, in March. Uh, and so, we already be started to see the impact of COVID in our transplant population, specifically in uh, our heart, trans heart transplant program. Uh, we were a relatively new program having only started in February of 2018. And uh, we started to see a few of our patients uh, 
come down with COVID and noted that, um, as, I, as we shared here in this publication, that uh, COVID seemed to have a more severe impact, at least on our heart transplant patients, than we did uh, observe in non-transplant patients. And this actually then became part of a, a much larger study, if we can go to the next slide, where uh, as part of Northwell Health, we examined our experience with um, COVID-19 uh, in hospitalized patients. So um, if we could go just to this next slide, we between March and April of 2020 had 10,000 patients uh, hospitalized for COVID-19. And uh, we wanted to see what specific impact being a transplant recipient had on outcomes. Uh, if we can click one more time, there's a, another text box there at the bottom. So again, it's only a two month period, over 10,000 patients. And as, as far as Northwell Health, that's that comprises the, probably one of the largest experience of COVID uh, patient care in the United States, especially at that time. If we can go to the next slide. So uh, of these 10,000 patients that were hospitalized with COVID-19, of those about nearly 100 of them were solid organ transplant recipients. And what we did to try to really tease out what impact being a transplant patient has uh, as it relates to COVID we did some very uh, sophisticated statistical analyses where we actually found matched patients in that cohort. So by matched, I mean, we tried to find a group of patients that aside from not being transplant patients, they were very, very similar to those 82 patients by way of age, other illnesses and things like that. And so that got us to about 1600 patients. And what we did is compare the outcomes of those two groups. If we can go click one more time, and what really was the startling conclusion, the take home message was that being a transplant patient uh, uniquely uh, put people at risk, meaning they were more than 30% more likely to die or require being pl placed on a ventilator uh, because of COVID illness than non-transplant patients. So this was a very, for us, for us in the medical community, a very striking finding. Uh, and if we can please go to the next slide, and many um, organizations in the transplant community have, uh, have rallied to sort of disseminate the information and what we believe uh, is the appropriate recommendation for patients uh, considering transplant or have undergone transplant. And this is just one example from my specific uh, association with the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant. And this is our official journal, the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant. And this is co-authored by some of the you know, most prominent figures in our field and the conclusion there is that while there is, we don't really know as much as we'd love to know about the risk of the vaccine on transplant patients, we do know that being a transplant patient poses a significant risk to getting a more severe form of the COVID-19 illness. And because of that fact, we believe that the benefit greatly outweighs the, what potential risk there might be uh, with the vaccine. And as a medical community, as a surgeon who does transplants, uh, I advocate very, very strongly for, for patients uh, getting the vaccination if you've had a transplant or if you're going to get a transplant in the near future. I wanna bring in Leilani Graham, who is, as we talked about before, an incredibly important uh, patient advocate. And she has a very powerful message connected to this whole question of COVID vaccine, plural vaccines, and the transplant community. Leilani, please share with us. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if they can get my slides up on my side. So starting off, uh, who am I? Um, I am a Stanford Medicine X uh, faculty member. I, thank you, worked at Stanford um, uh, in their founding PFAC on the advisory board. Um, and those are things that I've done volunteering, which has been fantastic um, for work. Um, I spent some time at Verily Life Sciences, um, which was after my four-year start at Google. And then I've worked um, as the Director of Patient Advocacy for Clara Health, 
So the next question, if you can actually go back to the previous slide, um, why are you listening to me? So I'm here to represent the patient voice on behalf of all transplant patients. Um, I'm, I know I'm heart, but I think a lot of this information is very applicable to any organ that you've had transplanted or if you're a living donor as well. Um, and I'm wanting to be representing you by calling together all these thoughts, opinions, uh, discussions that I've been seeing on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, um, and trying to represent, you know, what's going on in our community, uh, what are the biggest concerns, and how can we alleviate that stress? So, um, if we can go back to the uh, the previous slide, thank you so much. Um, so, as Steve mentioned, I am a heart transplant patient. I'm coming up on my five year anniversary uh, next in a couple weeks. Um, this is a non exhaustive list of complications I've had. However, I find it exhausting. Um, sorry, I had to throw in a dad joke. Um, essentially, I've experienced the ringer um, when it comes to transplant. I uh, went in having HCM beforehand, walked into the hospital, uh, was essentially wheeled out um, having had primary graft failure because it was a marginal donor. Um, but fortunately, I'm here now, um, but I'm sure many of you can relate to this. It's not just a transplant that you get, it's a transplant plus, um, and that continues to evolve and change. Um, and personally, I felt like COVID was just going to be a huge, you know, in bold text on this list. I've managed to avoid it so far. Um, but being in California, we're reopening. I have a lot of strong feelings about that. Um, but we've recently had, you know, extremely reduced ICU capacity. So um, these are the additional effects that we have felt as a transplant community. I mean, there's everything that's been going on globally, but specifically for us, um, some of the big ones have been loss of independence because we're spending time back inside. A lot of us have had to quarantine before. Um, people have lost insurance, which is obviously a huge part of being a transplant patient. Um, mental health, I personally have dealt with more depression during this time, um, partly because I feel like, you know, I'm wasting the extra time. Um, missed work, might have lost your job, uh, missed experiences, you know, canceling travel, unable to see your family. That's partly why you got a transplant, right? Um, and then just being left behind. I've noticed there's a lot more societal ableism. Um, you know, right now there's this discussion in California about the new vaccine rollout and how it doesn't include high-risk patients. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that and having to combat it in addition to staying safe. So our common concerns, um, these are things that I've sort of brought together uh, from different patients and from the internet. Um, the first one, the vaccine is brand new. Um, so that's not totally true. We do know that mRNA has been around for quite a long time. And, you know, there was so much effort put into this one. It was, it was different than the typical FDA review process. The second one is it will give me COVID. Fortunately, this is not a live vaccine. I know we're not allowed to take live vaccines. Um, and so if people are testing positive after they're getting the injection, that's because they were exposed beforehand. Uh, three, it wasn't studied in transplant patients. Well, that's true. We weren't included in those clinical trials. However, um, as Dr. Lima mentioned, there have been studies outside of this um, that essentially show that you know similar vaccines don't have any additional risk for transplant patients. Um, obviously, we don't know. We haven't you know tested this over time. Um, but the fact that transplant patients weren't specifically studied does not preclude us from being eligible. Uh, number four, it won't last. There is discussion, you know, is it only six months? Is it only eight months? You know, why risk it if it's only a few months? Um, my personal answer to that is I would rather still be alive than and get another shot in six months. That's how I feel. Um, five, this is the biggest one I've seen across the board, uh, is concern that it could cause rejection. Could it stimulate the T cells? And I'm going to leave that question, um, you know, up to the medical professionals in the room. Um, but essentially, you know, the, the opinion is that it shouldn't cause any additional risk. Obviously, they can't say it's not going to do anything. Um, personally, again, you know, none of us like to experience rejection. I totally get that. Um, but also, you know, given the great risk of COVID, the great risk of debilitating illness, um, you know, you have to weigh it personally. Um, and then six, not all teams say yes. I think uh, Dr. Lima just addressed this, but previously we'd been seeing, you know, some centers were saying, get it as soon as it's available. Others said, you know, it's too soon. There's a difference between some places saying, you know, oh, take it immediately after transplant or to wait a year. Um, so there is difference in opinion here, but as Dr. Lima mentioned across the board, um, it is definitely recommended. 
So I also want to just mention some real reactions that I'm seeing in the community. Um, as you may know, healthcare professionals have been eligible for this vaccine already, and surprising amount of transplant patients work in healthcare. Um, so I know an ICU doctor, she's two years post heart transplant, um, and she had no reaction at all to either vaccine. She's been working through this um, and was totally fine, felt just like the flu shot. I also know a woman who is six years post-transplant, also heart. She works as a nurse and she's been floating on COVID floors. So it's incredibly important for her to get this. She similarly had no reaction. Um, another one is a lung transplant who's you know barely 1.5 years post. Um, she's a little bit older, no reaction. Uh, the only reaction I've heard of was someone who had an allergic reaction. And so of course they were taken to the ER, they were already in the hospital. Um, but I'm not hearing anything about you know, immediate adverse problems, which is really reassuring. So of course, this has to be your decision. Um, you know, we can all advocate for it, but it's important that you feel you know, confident in it. Um, so what I recommend is obviously talk to your transplant team. Uh, talk to your transplant infectious disease team if you have one. Um, really jealous of, of the people who do, but fortunately, I like my infectious disease doctor. Um, talk to your primary care provider. You know, sometimes we forget that we have one because our team is the one that handles everything. Um, but it's good to check in with them too. And then of course, you know, uh, go to COVID19transplantresource.org, the people who are hosting this. Um, and then myast.org also has the most recent guidance um, from the medical community. And then talk to other transplant patients. There's a lot of misinformation going on online. I'm not saying you should get into any arguments, but I'm hoping that you know, teachings like these will help people understand that this is a good idea. So that's all I've got for the minute. And uh, yeah, looking forward to questions later. Leilani, you have um, offered not only an important and valuable perspective, but also your being so open and sharing your personal experience is powerful, is significant. And you just raised the social media question, the misinformation, the confusing information um, on the internet. I promise you we'll deal with that in the Q&A. And also the issue of rejection, which you mentioned, will obviously be ad addressed by the uh, two physician experts we have. In fact, I know that we have Dr. Ruth online right now. Dr. Ruth, uh, we look forward to your presentation and the order of it does in no way take away from the significance of it. So we look forward to hearing you, Dr. Ruth. Let's go, let's do it. All right, thanks everyone so much. Uh, good morning and uh, really appreciate you asking me to join today to provide an update on COVID vaccines and the vaccination program. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not able to see the slide. Oh, there we go, okay, perfect. So um, as many of you know and have heard already today, um, two vaccines received emergency use authorization or EUAs after careful FDA review. The first is Pfizer and BioNTech, which is a two dose reg regimen given at least um, 21 days apart. And the second is Moderna, a two dose regimen given at least 28 days apart. Both vaccines were tested in thousands, tens of thousands of adults from diverse backgrounds, including older adults and communities of color. Data from the clinical trials demonstrated that both vaccines were approximately 95% effective at preventing COVID-19 disease and both had favorable safety profiles. One thing to note is that we currently don't know, um, as Leilani mentioned, how long the protection from receiving a COVID vaccine might last, but there is ongoing work at CDC to help answer that question. Next slide, please. Both Pfizer and Moderna were developed using mRNA technology. mRNA vaccines are new technology that teaches our cells how to make a harmless um, piece of what's called the spike protein. The spike protein is found on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. After this protein piece is made, the cell breaks down those mRNA instructions and gets rid of them, so they don't remain. The immune system then makes antibodies against that spike protein, and they in turn protect us from SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. mRNA vaccines take advantage of the processes that cells use to make proteins in order to trigger that immune response. And here are a few things to know about these vaccines. Like all vaccines, COVID-19 mRNA vaccines have been rigorously tested for safety before being authorized for use in the United States. The technology is new, but not unknown. In fact, these uh, vaccines have been studied now for upwards of 10 years. 
mRNA vaccines do not contain a live virus and they do not um, carry the risk of causing disease in the vaccinated person. And then finally, that mRNA molecule from the vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell, and so it does not affect or interact the DNA of, of the person receiving the vaccine. I know that's been a concern in some groups. Next slide, please. So um, we recognize that there are many concerns about the safety of these first COVID vaccines, particularly because they did use new technology and their appearance um, has been of coming on the market quite quickly. But I'd like to reassure you that part of the reasons these vaccines were able to reach the market so quickly was that we were able to capitalize on existing networks already in place to test these vaccines rather than starting from scratch. Researchers used existing clinical trial networks, like those that study other medical treatments than vaccines, to quickly conduct the COVID-19 vaccine trials. And another critical piece in the, uh, has been this investment in manufacturing, even before the COVID-19 vaccines were proven effective. The U.S. government and vaccine manufacturers invested millions of dollars to scale up vaccine production while the clinical trials were still ongoing, greatly reducing the time then between the authorization of the vaccine and getting it out the door. Because of this great financial risk, um, the investment in a manufacturing process while the trials are ongoing is uh, really unprecedented, uh, but it's one of the reasons that we were able to get the vaccine to market so quickly. mRNA vaccines are also faster and cheaper to produce because they use ready-made materials, unlike some vaccines that require manufacturing in cell culture, which can take much more time. And then finally, certainly FDA and CDC have worked together and continue to work to quickly prioritize the review and approval of these vaccines for use. Next slide, please. So as we look at this slide, I want to remind everyone that the COVID-19 vaccination program is dynamic and it requires ongoing assessment as vaccine supply, demand, and the epidemiology of the outbreak changes to really inform the timing of expansion into subsequent phases um, of people prioritized to receive vaccine. ACIP and CDC have endorsed the guiding principle of efficient distribution, as well as jurisdictional flexibility for the COVID-19 vaccination program. So while this slide does show the different phases in their respective recommended populations, such as phase 1A with healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facilities, we give jurisdictions the flexibility to administer this guidance in the best way that they Dr. Ruth, uh, can you hear us right now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Absolutely. And we'd love to pick up your presentation and adapting and pivoting. Um, by the way, your military background, share everyone, share with everyone. And before you even do that, I've read about it. And I'm obviously, on behalf of everyone in the transplant community, needless to say, thank you so much for your service. Tell everyone your background on that end that I did not share. I apologize. Oh, no worries. I am a captain in the United States. States Public Health Service. So it's one of the um, uniformed services um, and provides um, emergency medical care as well as a variety of other services to the nation in times of need. Got it. Dr. Captain Ruth, please pick up your presentation. I know that I'm an inappropriate, in an inappropriate position to give you direction, but please pick up your presentation. It's fine. I, we're, we're, we're all learning to struggle with the intricacies of Zoom, I think, over the past year. So um, apologies to everyone, and uh, um, thank you for continuing to listen. So um, I think we'd left off with key facts about COVID vaccination, and I was just saying that there's so much information at our fingertips, it's really nice to be able to go somewhere um, that has the facts. And so I'll point you all to our cdc.gov website uh, for some of these key facts about COVID vaccination. So one is certainly that getting vaccinated can help you prevent, can help prevent you from getting sick from COVID-19 disease. That people who have gotten sick from COVID-19 may still benefit from getting the vaccine. So we are encouraging, even if you've had COVID, to um, seek vaccination opportunities. COVID vaccines will not give you COVID. So again, uh, we talked about that mRNA particle. This, um, you know, does not have components of a live virus. And so you cannot catch COVID from the vaccine. And uh, finally, um, COVID-19 vaccines will not cause you to test positive on a COVID viral test. 
um, like those PCR tests. So I know people um, can sometimes be concerned about that because those tests are required for travel and so forth. But for a PCR test, the vaccine will not interfere with that result. So again, encouraging you all to go to our cdc.gov homepage and click on COVID for more information um, than, than what I've just presented here. Next slide, please. So I want to point out that the safety of these COVID-19 vaccines is a top agency priority. And I think I came right back into the conversation when you were talking about safety amongst the transplant community. These vaccines are being held to the same safety standards as other routine vaccines. Several expert and independent groups evaluate the safety of these vaccines uh, being given to people in the United States both before and after um, their authorization. So before any vaccines are authorized or approved, the FDA carefully reviews the safety data from the clinical trials. And then the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, which is an independent body of experts, reviews all the safety data before recommending use. FDA and ACIP have qualified scientific and clinical experts um, to really minimize the conflicts of interest before reviewing all of these data. And then after any vaccines are authorized or in use, both CDC and FDA continue to monitor their safety. Existing systems can rapidly detect problems uh, with the vaccine. And these systems are being scaled up for COVID-19 vaccine introduction to really fully meet the demands of this nation where we're seeking to vaccinate everybody. Additional systems and data sources are also being developed to further enhance our safety monitoring capabilities. So again, we don't want one stone to go unturned when it comes to safety of these vaccines. So there are multiple systems in place that allow CDC and FDA to watch for safety issues. One is called vSafe, which is a new smartphone-based after-vaccination health checker for people receiving COVID-19 vaccines. So um, we're asking people when they get the vaccines to enroll in vSafe so we can continue to monitor them. And then both CDC and the FDA have a long-standing safety system called the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, or VAERS. And this is a national system that collects reports from healthcare professionals, vaccine manufacturers, and the public. All vaccine adverse events get reported into the system. And um, if those, uh, the number of reports um, looks to be unexpected or appears to happen more often than expected or have unusual patterns, we can follow up quickly and get this information out if needed. Next slide, please. So I feel like this might be my most important slide. The COVID-19 vaccine is an important tool to help stop the pandemic, but it continues to be only one of the tools in our toolbox. While these mRNA vaccines do appear highly effective, additional prevention tools still remain important to stop the spread of COVID. So the combination of getting vaccinated, but then also continuing to follow those recommendations to protect yourself and others will really offer us the best protection against COVID and a chance at stopping the pandemic. Wash your hands, avoid close contact, cover your nose and mouth with a mask, clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces. All of these messages I know you've heard before, but we want to continue to reinforce them. Even after vaccination, it's critically important to continue to use what we're calling non-pharmaceutical interventions in order to help us stop the pandemic from spreading. It's going to take time to vaccinate all people living in the United States. And so, um, Taking these measures, continuing to um, employ these measures to protect yourself and your families um, will just be critically important. So with that, I'll turn to my last slide, which is just to say thank you, and, and I'll add a special thank you for your patience. Dr. Ruth, I, I know I speak for everyone on this webinar by simply saying it was uh, more than worth waiting for getting you. And, and while we have you, a couple of things. And, and again, just in the spirit of everything that Dr. Ruth just shared, um, Scarlin, who's our director here, and uh, he has his mask on. He's six feet away. And I'm not showing off. I'm just saying we had a practice where we preach. Actually, Dr. Fauci yesterday was talking about two masks, right? Um, which leads me to this while we have you, Dr. Ruth, a couple of things. Lots of information out there, lots of media reporting about the new strain or new strains of COVID, if you will. 
What is the message you want to share with everyone in the transplant community, everyone who's part of the coalition, about these new strains, the vaccines that we have now, Moderna and Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, cross sorry. our fingers. What is the message that you want everyone in this webinar to take away today regarding those new strains, particularly in the transplant community? Please, doctor. Yes, thank you for that question. I think it's one that's on everybody's mind right now. And I will say on behalf of the CDC that we are really monitoring closely the reports out of the United Kingdom and other countries about these new variants of the virus. Viruses constantly change through mutation. We know that right. uh, this is something that um, is to be expected. And so the question is, um, do these mutations uh, have an impact on the vaccine? This is, again, something we are going to continue to monitor in the months ahead. We have a team at CDC that is dedicated to vaccine effectiveness. Um, so not just what happens in the clinical trials, but what we're seeing in the real world as vaccine circulation continues. And so those data will be forthcoming as soon as um, we collect and analyze those data. But I think I can, um, the bottom line right now is that uh, based on the available data we have to date, we do not believe that this new variant, uh, the one coming out of the UK, will impact the effectiveness of these two vaccines at this time. Um, and it's something we'll continue to follow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ruth. Dr. Lima, let me follow up with you if we can put up Dr. Lima again. Dr. I'm gonna, Dr. Lima, I'm going to ask you to follow up on Dr. Ruth's very um, relevant and thoughtful response to that question, particularly as it relates to the transplant community. Dr. Lima, what, if anything, do you have to add? Please. Well, I, I think... Um... I don't really have much to add except that we it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we encourage people to um, get vaccinated and to dispel some of the i hate to say myths or um, but it, there's really a lot of information out there uh whether it's through social media or uh, other other venues that um are are unfortunately hindering progress uh, in, in trying to get COVID behind us. And um, we hear a lot about these different variants. And the fact of the matter is because of how the, the vaccine has been engineered, it is at least theoretically uh, able to still um, protect against those variants. Um, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that even myself, you know, I, I was vaccinated. We still have to uh, practice social distancing because you can still unknowingly, particularly early after getting a vaccine, be a spreader. Uh, you could still be an asymptomatic spreader of the, vac of, of, of the virus. So you still have to be cautious and, and practice appropriate social distancing measures. Uh, and so that's also important. It's not like you get the vaccine and you could, uh, you know, throw the mask out the window and just sort of, <laughs> you have to still, still abide by, by the restrictions. Uh, well said. Uh, Leilani, can we, uh, I'm going to follow up again. Uh, interesting, when you listen to the experts we have on this panel, it triggers even more questions beyond the great questions that we got uh, leading into this webinar. But Leilani, let me ask you, as you listen to um, our two physician experts, my question to you is, Dr. Lima and Dr. Ruth have shared their perspective on these new strains. What are you hearing as an advocate in the transplant community? What concerns and or questions are you hearing that we need to put out there in the media and deal with in a responsible and credible fashion? Leilani, please. Um, that's a great <laughs> question and in incredibly timely. Um, you know, I, I actually have a friend who's, uh, I believe she's one year out of a heart transplant. She has a PhD in microbio and was living in the UK. So she was the perfect person to um, bring this to my attention, which is, you know, what I'm hearing now is that, uh, you know, scientists over there are theorizing that these variants might even be, um, uh, it may be immunocompromised bodies in which these variants are um, mutating uh, because we have the infection longer, because it um, takes us longer to clear it, and so it gives time for uh, for COVID to mutate. Um, again, I won't, I won't necessarily comment on that because I'm not a doctor, but um, 
that's that's the kind of thing that we're hearing. Um, you know, we're also hearing about the California variant, and you know, is it more deadly? Does it transmit more quickly? Um, you know, I, I think there's a, a lot of fear about it mutating so much that you know we're just going to be stuck inside all the time, um, and particularly with the differences in in states of when people are able to be vaccinated. Um, you know, there's there's absolutely the fear that you know if if you're waiting a longer time, uh, your chances of you know, something happening go up if there's more variation. So that's that's mostly what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, after listening to Leilani, there are a couple of things I want to follow up with Dr. Ruth on. First of all, if we could put up the website, uh, Sue and the team, if we could put up the website, the COVID-19 transplant resource.org, if we could put that up while we're listening to Dr. Ruth. Dr. Ruth, you heard Leilani, correct? Dr. Ruth, yes, I did. Are we, do we have her online? Yes. Okay. Please don't let that hang there because Leilani very effectively and, and in a very relevant and important way raised a couple of questions and concerns and fears. Please respond. So, you know, I, these are questions that we all have and I, um, I appreciate her sharing. I think one thing that we are really trying to do at CDC is to reach out to different groups to hear their concerns and then be able to target messages accordingly. Um, you know, a couple things. One, it's incredibly important to um, make sure that we have factual information out there. And I think also to be credible when uh, we don't have the answers just yet. I can talk to you a lot about the things we're doing at CDC to uncover some of the answers to the questions, Leilani, that you posed. Um, I absolutely hear the fear of that delay and getting vaccinated and then wondering what will happen. Um, you know, we are working incredibly hard right now to try uh, to move vaccination efforts along um, just, you know, past 1A prioritized populations and into those 1B, 1C groups. Um, I think, you know, the um, we're hearing a lot in the media right now, but we have some there's some good news out there. We have over 41 million vaccines distributed as of this week. And vaccine administration is happening across all 64 of our jurisdictions, including the United States Pacific um, uh, affiliated uh, Pacific Islands. So um, th this is a, a, it's a big win. And I think we are listening to the jurisdictions. We're talking to special interest groups to hear their concerns and then trying to pull those together to make sure that um, we are getting vaccine out um, to those prioritized communities as quickly as possible. Um, so, again, I think I you know, hear your concerns. I hear your fears and um, and let you know that we definitely are looking into all of the questions that you've posed today. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Um, can we go back to uh, Dr. Lima? You know, Dr. Lima, uh, hopefully you can hear me out on Long Island. You, you got yes. me? Um, mm -hmm. so, so, Doctor, let me ask you this. So many questions that, that have come in again and, and as we move into as we moved into this webcast. But this is I want to read this verbatim. Um, Dr. Lima, you've been studying the impact of COVID-19 on solid organ transplant recipients, obviously. Obviously, our audience are very uh, concerned about these studies. Many questions come out of it. Dr. Lima, are there any, from the research that's been done, and there's very limited time, are there any quote unquote side effects that we have not covered, that we have not talked about, that we should be aware of without unnecessarily alarming people? What do we know? and what we should be concerned about. Again, loaded question, Dr. Lima. And I, and I appreciate people being so candid as to say, mm -hmm. I don't know, we don't know. Because to say otherwise, as someone in the media, I will tell you, when I have someone, whether it's a clinical professional or a government official or a corporate executive who answers a question that they don't know the answer to, particularly when you're dealing in public health, I find it to be incredibly irresponsible. So if we don't know, Let's say we don't know, but here's what we need to do to find out. Dr. Lima, please. Sure. So uh, we don't necessarily know, meaning that um, we will, first of all, we don't have a reason to believe or suspect that it would have more adverse uh, allergic uh, reactions in the transplant population. 
it's not as as mentioned i think by a few of the panelists it is not uh the covid vaccine is not a live attenuated virus virus so um you really wouldn't be able to get in, you know infected with covid by the vaccine itself so that's not possible so short of that there's not a reason to think that uh, p- transplant patients should anticipate worse allergic reaction to the vaccination itself ha- do we have data to support that well anecdotal uh you know a case here a case there just but we don't have the numbers to you know put a seal of approval on that fact um but clinical judgment would di- would dictate that we don't have a reason to believe it should so i think uh i'm not concerned about it. Um, if anything, it's not so much to, uh, an allergic reaction or an adverse reaction to the uh, vaccination that is of concern for me, but in a transplanted patient with on immunosuppression, is the efficacy of the vaccine going to be attenuated or is the durability of the vaccine going to be attenuated? That's more of what my uh, uh, concern is, is, is centered, not so much the reaction to the vaccination itself. So let me ask you, Dr. Lima, a is for Raymond and others, they want to know if and my wife, Jennifer, asked the same thing, who, as I said, I donated her kidney, whether you're on the recipient end or the donor end, will the efficacy of the vaccine be lower for Raymond because he's immunosuppressant, he's immunosuppressant medication that he currently takes? That's important to know. Then I want to get to the issue of rejection. Dr. Lima, go ahead, please. Sorry so, for all that disruption. No, no, no worries at all. So... <clears throat> Part of the issue is we don't know the answers yet, and that was going to come with time. So that's why, on some level, it is a one could say a bit of a leap of faith in that we know how what the risks are of not getting the vaccine. We know what the risks are of getting COVID if you're a transplant patient, and we want to avoid that at all costs. And we also have data to go on from previous experiences we've had with other vaccines in the transplant population. So it's not that we're flying blind. We've, for, for many, many years, uh, can refer to a catalog of experiences with the flu vaccine in transplant recipients um, and the herpes zoster vaccine. So this is not something that it would be unprecedented. And so based on that, we don't have a reason to believe that being a transplant recipient would somehow lead to an increased risk of rejection or... Uh, an attenuation of the efficacy of the vaccination over time, of the vaccine over time. But we do have to test these things. So that is this next phase of information that should be coming our way. Um, There is always, of course, the theoretical risk. If you are on uh, anti-rejection drugs, particularly early after a transplant, because that's when the doses of those medications are at their height uh, and they tend to, uh, you know, be decreased over time, so in those early couple of months, that would be the theoretical window of time when the risk of having the efficacy of the vaccine be uh, attenuated the most. So on a theoretical basis, you would try ideally to either get the vaccination before you get transplanted, or if you are already transplanted, maybe waiting a few months, say six months uh, to get the vaccine. But uh, these are still things being ironed out, but time will tell. And unfortunately, we don't have all the information we'd love to have. Um, really helpful, Dr. Lima. Let, let me put this out there, and I should have mentioned this before. Um, first of all, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us on, on, joining us in this most important webcast. But I want to share something else, to, particularly to our friends uh, at the New Jersey Sharing Network and others around the country involved in this most important initiative. Our production company is connected to, is tied to partnering with PBS in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region. We're very committed to vaccine education, vaccine awareness programming. And because we got into this, because I was asked to, and I'm honored to participate and moderate today, we've expanded our programming in cooperation with the Sharing Network in New Jersey to actually take, if we can, some of the pieces some of the video clips of this program incorporated into a broader program that talks specifically about the impact of COVID-19 vaccines on the transplant community. So again, this leads into a question for Leilani. The role of, quote, the media overall, Mm -hmm. and then more specifically, you mentioned social media. Leilani, let me ask you, misinformation, confusion, conspiracy theories, and God knows what else. 
Mm -hmm. What, in your view, is the role that we in the media should be playing? And what are your concerns about, quote unquote, social media as it relates to informing and educating people about what we could, should and do know about the vaccines and the transplant community? Sorry for that long winded question, Leilani. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, the the biggest thing that needs to happen overall is having uh, easily um, understandable resources. Uh, you know, I see within the groups, there's a lot of that misinformation coming out. People don't necessarily quote where they're getting it from. I mean, that's the internet. Um, but having, you know, very specific things that we can share, you know, the CDC has come up with so many great graphics. Um, having one internet resource where we can see all the information, having clips like this. I mean, having different modes of media is really important for how people learn differently. Um, I think that's the biggest thing because we don't have moderators in these groups necessarily. Um, and we have different levels of you know, uh, education when it comes to, um, you know, people who work in healthcare, people who don't. Uh, you know, the, the most surprising thing I'm seeing is, is people saying, you know, I won't get the vaccine ever. Um, I don't trust them, which is surprising as a transplant patient, because I think there's a lot of trust that goes into being a transplant patient in that, you know, we're on all these medications and we have to trust um, our team that this is the right thing to do for us. Um, so what I would like to see more in the media and actually across uh, different clinics and different transplant organizations is just having, um, you know, ideally one clear message um, and then a resource where patients can ask questions. I've noticed right now it's, you know, my team's incredible, but they're, they're working very hard. So it's a little difficult for me to just call them up and say, hey, I have eight questions. Can we just talk for half an hour? Um, so having that accessible resource is so important. Dr. Lima, let me try this, particularly in light of what Leilani just said. Not only are we in the media important in this, not only is social media a huge information platform and player, but so are healthcare professionals, so are frontline folks like yourself particularly for the frontline healthcare professionals dealing directly with caring for the transplant community who are potentially resistant themselves, the frontline physicians, nurses, clinicians who are resistant to the vaccine. How significant is, of an issue is that as it relates to educating, informing, and encouraging those in the transplant community to in fact aggressively, assertively, and smartly pursue the vaccine? Well, um, I think as the vaccine was being rolled out and different um, healthcare uh, workers were getting their turn at, you know, at bat, so to speak, to get vaccinated, there was some consternation, some anxiety about, well, you know, gee, I don't want to be the guinea pig, right? Uh, I'll uh, wait and see how the vaccination goes with uh, the first round of folks. So I think now that we're we're, we're seeing um, that, by and large, uh, with really no notable exceptions that I that come to mind, it's gone pretty smoothly. Not many uh, bad reactions, and so I think with time we're going to see that that resistance um, get get uh, it, less and less so. As I think as people start to see that, well, okay, uh, I my have my other coworkers got it; they're doing fine. So that I think will will come with time, and I think I don't anticipate that being too much of an issue, especially for frontline workers that are in areas of the country that are still really struggling with with COVID. I think that's an easy risk benefit analysis calculation to make, where if you're sitting there day in day out in the you know uh, in the trenches with COVID patients uh, being exposed, potentially risking exposure to your family. It's, a, it's almost a no-brainer for a lot of people, but maybe those that are less so in the direct uh, involvement one-on-one -on -one with COVID patients, maybe they're not as gung-ho about wanting to minimize that risk. So I think that has some level, uh, you know, something to do with it too, kind of where you are in the country and what is it, what area of medicine interaction do you have with these, uh, with these patients? A tough question, I know. How candid is the conversation among frontline healthcare professionals like yourself, particularly those caring for treating folks in the transplant community, how candid and honest is that discussion about the vaccine? 
It's very candid. I mean, it's because so much we're still learning as we go. And um, uh, you, you kind of have to go out on a limb a little uh, a, a bit here because we don't have a lot of data to go by. We know it's effective in the general population. It wasn't tested in transplant patients. Yet I think um, seeing how negatively it, it impacted our transplant patients helped us arrive at the conclusion that, you know, at the end of the day, we're not going to always know everything. You, you, kind of, you have to have, you use clinical judgment, right? You know, and so clinical judgment is not always a yes or no textbook answer. You have to make a calculation, a judgment. And I think in this case, what we know so far forces us to believe that really what's best for our patients, which is what is the most important thing at the end of the day, what guides our day-to-day -day existence as clinicians is getting vaccinated. Dr. Root, this is a question that several people raised in anticipation of this webinar. When it has to do with, uh, with post-vaccine monitoring and development of a national database, Dr. Ruth, does the CDC have such a system, A and B? How exactly does that system work, Dr.? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. I think we actually had a slide on our vSafe program. So I'm happy remind to talk us, through it. Remind this us, book, doctor. Uh, that this is something that was developed um, in the wake of COVID-19 vaccination because we knew we needed to have a very rigorous system to, um, to uncover any safety signal uh, very rapidly. And so, um, yes, this VSAFE is a new CDC smartphone-based monitoring program for vaccine safety. So when you uh, go to get your COVID-19 vaccine, you are asked um, to volunteer to enroll in the system. And it's a text-based text messaging system, as well as some um, web surveys that allows us to check in with vaccine recipients on a very regular basis. Um, it's an opportunity for recipients of the vaccine to report any side effects or health problems um, immediately into the system. So again, we're capturing this information in real time. Um, we also, for any um, adverse event that's reported through the system, we have active telephone follow-up. So again, this is just a way that we can really monitor adverse events closely and get this information out to the public as soon as possible. So um, it, it's been, there's been a great response to vSafe. I think we have over 2 million people who have voluntarily enrolled in the system. And I'd encourage everybody here um, to consider it uh, when they do get their COVID vaccine. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. and Captain Ruth. Leilani, let me follow up with you. So this is not something that was asked by anyone leading up to the event, to this webinar, but I'm confident there are a fair number of people across the country listening to us right now, watching us right now, who are asking this. I mentioned it before, often the answer is we don't know. Right. What message do you have to members of the transplant community who are not only concerned but fearful of that answer we don't know, when in fact that answer we don't know is not only an accurate answer, but as I said before, the responsible answer, but saying here's what we do need to try to find out, here's what we're trying to do, here's what we need, the follow-up research we, we need to do on the vaccines, because it has been only 11 months, 10 or 11 months, if you will, so it's a long-winded way of asking this question, Ilani, from your unique perspective, mm -hmm. which is so important to us today. What message would you share to many who are in this webinar, on this webinar, who are saying, what do you mean you don't know? We're looking for expert, not only advice, but direction, when in fact the legitimate, honest answer is, and in some cases, we don't know. Ilani? That's a great question. I think... Um you know, transplant patients are uniquely kind of used to that question um, and that answer of, of we don't know. Um, you know, I'm someone who's constantly poking at the research team going, so how many <laughs> average years do I have left? Um, and, you know, the usual answer is, well, we hope for many, but we don't know. Um, you know, the, the same kind of thing, you know, what triggers rejection that we don't understand? Well, we don't know. Um, you know, I, the science is only 50 years old on this, and I say only in quotes because it's so complex. Um, but 
I, I think I speak for other transplant patients when I say that that having that answer um, in clinic is not uncommon. Um, you know, my message regarding uh, this particular um, issue is just that, you know, it. I think that we're, we're progressing to a place where we are starting to actually trust the federal government um, in terms of how it's being rolled out. Um, you know, I'm seeing so much more transparency um, between, you know, states and, 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 uh, and the administration and whatnot. Um, so I think as, as long as people continue to honestly answer that with, you know, we don't know, and then following it up with, but we're going to find out, or here's a study you could be involved in. I know uh, a lot of people have been involved in the Johns Hopkins study. Um, I think that's an interesting one for, for people to look into. Um, but but my shorter answer essentially is that, uh, you know, again, you have to weigh it as your personal option. Um, but for someone like me, I would rather take the, you know, the we don't know, but we think it's the best option rather than, you know, here's a for sure thing where you're probably going to get very sick. Um, mm. I know I know transplant patients who have done very well with COVID, um, but it's just your personal choice if, if you think that um, that the risk is worth it or not. Dr. Ruth, if we can get Dr. Ruth back. Uh, again, a question that I've heard anecdotally from friends, um, particularly from women who raise this issue. And again, particularly for the transplant community, this may sound like a question that's, gen that's generic and it's for anyone uh, curious or concerned about the vaccine. Can you put this to rest, doctor, that there are a significant number of women and men, disproportionately women, who do ask the question, particularly in the transplant community, hey, wait a minute, um, if I'm planning on getting pregnant, what, if anything, should I be concerned about as it relates to the vaccine? Because there were not women who were pregnant in these trials. But anecdotally, what I've heard from credible clinicians is that there is no connection or there doesn't appear to be a connection. And I'm anticipating some of this being I don't know or we don't know. But it's a long winded way of asking this again. What should the message be, Dr. Ruth, to those who are concerned about the question of getting pregnant or if they are pregnant as it relates to these vaccines, particularly in the transplant community? Dr. Ruth. Um, thanks very much for that question. And again, you know, um, when we do clinical trials, I think uh, one of the first um, efforts made is to really do those clinical trials in, in fairly healthy adults. Now, again, these clinical trials did include people with um, uh, comorbid conditions, and um, even um, folks with HIV were also included in these clinical trials, again, to try to make it, them as generalizable as possible to, um, to the public. But there are some groups that we did not study particularly children and pregnant women. And I think, you know, the reason is we want to make sure that uh, the vaccine is safe in the general community before going to these more vulnerable communities. Um, this is something that we are continuing to look at. So there definitely are efforts underway to understand the safety and effectiveness of COVID vaccine in women and, and in pregnant women. And we will continue to um, look at that question and publish data as quickly as we possibly can in order for um, everybody to be on the same page with regards to the safety of these vaccines in, in pregnancy. You know, Dr. Ruth, we only have a couple of minutes left, but you raised the question of children. Is there any particular message you want to deliver? And I'll follow up with Dr. Lima to parents of children, of children themselves who are recipients or organ, organ recipients, are there, as it relates to the vaccine, there's a question here, I promise. What should they be thinking about and concerned about? Dr. Ruth first, please. Well, again, I'm, um, I'm not a transplant medicine doctor, so the question probably will be better answered by Dr. Lima. But I will say uh, we okay. do have ongoing trials right now in children and um, are, are looking to address, again, the effectiveness and safety question in children now as well, um, now that we have the data uh, from our large adult trials. Got it. Dr. Lima, please, in the moments we have left, any uh, sp specific thoughts in this area, Dr. Lima? 
I would have to echo what Dr. Ruth says in that um, basically that's going to be data that's forthcoming. It's going to be when it makes sense to conduct those studies uh, in children. Um, we just don't have enough really to, to make that call right now. Um, so unfortunately, it is a, it's a definite I don't know. Um, but like everything else, we'll be systematic okay. about it. We'll be prudent um, and do what we think is, is, is in the best interest of, the, of our patients. So uh, let's do this as we wrap up. Dr. Lima, I'll start with you. 30 seconds, final message you want to deliver to everyone listening, watching this very important webinar that the coalition, uh, Transplant Coalition has put together. Your final thoughts, 30 seconds, please, Dr. Lima. So first and foremost, I think um, we know that uh, COVID-19 poses a uniquely dangerous risk to transplant patients more so than the general population. And while we don't have all the answers we'd like to have at this time as far as how long the vaccine would last or um, side effects, we don't have a reason to believe that they would be any worse than other vaccines we've used routinely in transplant patients. So when you put it all together, I strongly, strongly believe that in the best interest of uh, any transplant patient, uh, the vaccine makes sense 100%. Thank you so much, Dr. Lehman. Dr. Ruth, please, final thoughts. Okay, well, I will uh, continue with my public health message that uh, I think applies to this audience, but also um, to the general public, which is uh, we have two vaccines on the market. We do believe that they are safe and effective. And um, as you are holding up your mask, my final word will be, please remember, um, don't exclude those non-pharmaceutical interventions, masking, social distancing, good hand washing, um, even after vaccination, um, so that we can all put our efforts together to keep our community safe. Thank you. No, thank you, uh, Dr. and Captain Ruth. Leilani, final thoughts to our uh, huge audience, an engaged audience, uh, part of this very important webinar. Please, Leilani. I think my final thought is, I mean, obviously, personally, I'm very much for the vaccine. Um, I think people are fearful looking towards the future. You know, what will it do? Will it cause issues? I encourage people to look towards their past. What have you been through? What are you willing to go through now? Um, Personally, I, you know, I had necrotizing pneumonia. It's the same kind of thing that COVID has been causing. I'm not willing to go through that again. I'm sure there's a lot of lung transplant patients who understand and would also not be willing to go through it again. Um, So again, you know, talk to your resources, keep pushing your um, politicians or doctors or whomever it is for answers. Um, You know, I I think we're shifting to a place where we're more like, okay, we want it now, um, whether or not do we want it at all. Um, But, you know, Kudos to everybody engaged in this webinar that's, that's you know, trying to learn more and ask those questions. And, um, you know, I hope you continue to get the support from your teams and your family and whatever you decide. To Leilani, to Dr. Lima, to Dr. Ruth, if we had the technology to see the well over 1,000 participants in this webinar, you'd see the thumbs up, you'd see people applauding. You'd see people saying, thank you so much for your insight, your expertise, your candor. You're uh, responding directly to what you know and what you don't know. So um, I want to thank all of our panelists. I also want to thank the Transplant Life Foundation, obviously the COVID-19 Transplant Community Coalition, and the folks who you see the graphic up there, and also the folks at the New Jersey Sharing Network to Joe Roth and Elise Glennon. Thank you for allowing me to not just be a part of what you are doing in New Jersey, but what is going on in the transplant community throughout this nation. I want to repeat something I said earlier. It is through the support of the Sharing Network in New Jersey that we in our public broadcasting production company are able to do uh, public education and awareness programming around um, organ and tissue donation. And now more than ever before, programming around COVID-19 the vaccines, and its impact on the transplant community. So I look forward to those ongoing programs uh, and using the information, video clips, if possible, from this webinar and continuing that effort. Also, I want to let folks know that um, this webcast has been recorded. And if, in fact, you want to check it out, look at it again, or refer other people to it, I refer you to the Transplant Life Foundation's YouTube page. 
please watch it, learn from it. Um, again, we encourage you to go to the website, the, uh, the website, which is COVID19transplantresource.org. I'll say that again. Hopefully it's up on the screen as I say it, the COVID19transplantresource.org website. And finally, on behalf of everyone um, who is part of the COVID-19 Transplant Community Coalition, it has been my honor to be a part of this most important webinar to everyone behind the scenes, to Sue and Mary and John and Scarlin and everyone else who's been a part of this. Thank you for making it happen. It has been my honor to uh, moderate this and learn from it along with you. Most importantly, stay safe, be well, and let's stick together. I'm Steve Adubato. Thanks for being a part of this historic and important webinar.